Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hi there, and thanks very much for joining us once again. We've got a busy programme ahead of us. We're going to take a look at the Six Nations squad, speak to somebody who has left Rugby Union to become a professional boxer, and find out what is going on at Harlequins. But for the duration, I've got a fox who is trapped, but don't worry, it's inside the Wales camp, so it's not all bad. It's Jonathan Davis. And in the animal theme, somebody who definitely knows his sheep, from his shoops. You probably had to watch or listen last week to get that one, but I know you all never miss it. It's Sean O'Brien. Gents, how are you? Hi, Lee. How are you? Yeah, you look, good, you look yeah, a bit Lee. different. You look a bit different this evening. It's the ponytail. Oh, it's it's the, ponytail. the lazy, the hair it's the sort of lockdown mm-hmm. hair. Suits you now, I must I say. I tell you what, Suits this you. is all, this is the perfect example of lockdown hair. Ponytail, boxy shaved his head, and you've got a hat on. I, you're 100% right. My hair is out of control at the minute. But anyway, look. And if you were excited last week with your shampoo, you bought a, if you didn't see it, Foxy, he basically got some shampoo and he was trying to convert a uh, bomb, Adam Jones, mm. into this shampoo. You know, you can get dry shampoo, so you can basically spray it in and yeah, you don't yeah. even have to have a shower. It's a real cheat. Foxy's all over it. I was, it's, it's a time saver, isn't it? <laughs> it is a time saver. We sweat. We sweat a lot every day. I don't I think we actually need a shower, to be fair. Yeah. For hygiene well, purposes. Well, how come you know about it, Jonathan? My wife's got dry shampoo and it's a, it's a fail safe, so... Um... What's been happening with you guys then, Fox? So you're in camp. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I suppose what you've downloaded, all your movies, your box sets, you're ready to go for your isolation. Yeah, so obviously room to ourselves and just um, any recommendations, really. I'm, I'm, I'm finishing Cobra Kai. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but I, I need recommendations. Get on to, get on to Money Heist, Foxy. Uh, you're three years behind us, Shawnee boy. <laughs> <laughs> three years ago, oh, that's out, really? Yeah, I've done that, done it, dusted. Lupin, have you tried Lupin? No, I've seen that advertised. Is that the that's dub as well? Yeah, so it's all based in France. Um, and instead of just subtitles, they've got a sort of like American voiceover on it. But it is, it's pretty good. You've got to get, wait till the end of episode one and then it takes a twist and then you're kind of hooked. But there's five episodes out. Speaking of things, actually, I have a question for you, Lee, actually. Did you see that um, the Fab Ruby poll during the week, no? Yes, I did. So it was like, about, saw Henry Slade voted the most handsome man in the Premiership. Yeah. I'd like to get your opinion on that, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was up against Craig Doyle in the final. Yeah, but like what? Do you think he's handsome? Is he handsome? Of course he's handsome. I mean, I think everybody here would say handsome. Is, is this like a sort of uh, kill, marry, avoid, all of a sudden we're playing of rugby? I don't know. I just I was intrigued to hear your thoughts on it. Mm. Would he be your cup of tea now? I definitely prefer Sean backs as opposed to forwards. Oh, why? Why? <laughs> may I ask? <laughs> Well, that's a oh, given, no. isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, was in, I was in the Welsh camp when it was in his heyday where, like, boys would be going for a sunbed night before a game and uh, boys would have a spray tan and stuff. I don't think I should name names, but it was... Do you know what, actually? Doddy, Weir, Doddy Weir's brother um, oh, gave me advice when I was probably about, I don't know, 10 years old or something. And it was way beyond the time, before the time of the finishers. And he basically... and I'm, He was a back row, but his advice was never date somebody if they've got two numbers on their back. That was all his (laughs) only advice just to get me through my life. Never date someone if they've got two numbers on their back because they're unreliable. Well, sure. 15, 10 were the worst. That means you're after saying you'd go for backs more than forwards. Well, I'm not taking his advice. Oh, (laughs) right. I'm just telling you I was given advice. Right, right, right. And why, like, why do all, why do birds in general go for backs more so than forwards like? Have you any like have you any insight into this? Just I have, just, I have just for I have myself no here. I, I see you're trying too hard with the cap back to front, Shorty, but I think it all starts from there, to be honest. I'm telling you, I can't. I'm I look like I look like Warren. I look like Warren of there's something about Mary um with the cap <laughs> face and forward. Caps don't really suit me face and forwards, and I barely get away with it like this. And my hair is out of control. So I'm sticking with it on Foxy for tonight, to be honest. Um, so, Foxy, let's talk about your life at the moment. You are in your hotel room. Um, camp yeah. seems to have started pretty early for Wales. Um, what's it like so far? We have came in yesterday, Monday morning, and they've jumped straight onto it. They're going to work us hard this week. We are currently doing... Um, we have an altitude chamber in our facility, 
but obviously due to COVID, we can't use it because it's quite a small chamber. So they've brought in these machines to replicate altitude and we're doing early morning bike sessions uh, at altitudes with these masks on. It's pretty, um, you get quite anxious because you can't control mm. your breathing and there's not much air there. So it's, it's pretty horrible. The boys are getting worked extremely hard. So we're trying to get a bit of a block in of, of, of good training. And um, yeah, no, it's nice to be back in, but obviously it's, um, you feel pretty remote at the moment, but um, you know, it's, you just got to get on with it and knuckle down and get the work done. Do you think Foxy, that type of training, because I know like from speaking to you obviously before and stuff, it's been a part of the Wales program for a good while now, isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's, it, it does help us. I think it's, you know, um, the idea behind it is to get more volume into us without taking it out on our legs a bit too much. So um, it's only like a 15 minute session, but it's pretty intense. Like you've, you've worked with Bobby, Sean, mm. you know what he's like and he's, yeah. he's, he's yeah, very brilliant. thorough. He's and um, yeah. so we do it every morning, you know, early morning session. And um, sometimes cause you don't get the intensity when you're playing games for your club, that step up. I think that using this week is, is a, it's a good help for us to get um, up and run into test match level. Cause you know, the difference is huge. And, you know, if you can, take away some of that lung busting feeling in the first 20 of a test match it um it all helps really he's going around he's going around belting people with the ropes so is he to keep his own oh going. yeah well due to covid the the rope's not <laughs> out as uh okay, as great. Great, great, so we're great, all safe okay. from there how different um are the the covid measures i mean jamie george was actually talking last week that uh, in the england camp you know or any of the sort of communal spaces whether it be games rooms or virtual golf or anything that we sometimes see popping up in our social media videos and things like that that's all gone it's very much i think you could maybe eat it in twos at different tables but you had to go straight to your room when you weren't training is that similar for you guys yeah it's pretty similar like everyone's all pretty much signed up to the same protocols um we're trying to, you know, try and get social events in smaller groups um, at a social distance and stuff. So it's, you know, we, we eat at tables. And I think we have five on a big table, which is quite spread out. And just little things like putting on plastic gloves when we go um, to the buffet to get our own food. It's it, it's all very thorough, hand sanitizer everywhere. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it probably ha helps quite a lot of the boys because they're all gamers. They all play on COD. They, um, <clears throat> they all go to their rooms and just sit on, their, sit on their backsides and get on with it playing COD. They're all mic'd up together. Um, and I think Liam <laughs> Williams actually apparently streams or something. I don't know what, what that's all about. It's my worst nightmare. I see a lot of lads in, in Irish, they, they, they do the same thing. And I, I just don't get it. But they get so Spent into hours. it as well. Like They don't even talk to their missus or their, their wife or kids or anything. They're like zoned in on this thing that's just mental. Like It's like, I said, have you nothing better to do in your lives? Like, <laughs> do, and, and they do it for four and five hours. So you, you know with the boys. Oh, they put good stints in. Mm. They put good stints in. Madness. It's, yeah, it's not for me. I'd much rather watch something on Netflix or, you know try and read a book but I don't get through many let me tell you <laughs> hey there's a good one there's a good one I'd recommend to you I'll send me on your address I'll post you out a good one available from all good bookstores if you it? want a good book I'll, <laughs> I'll bang you on for fuel there <laughs> uh, a side, side copy would be lovely it's an interesting point though because if the younger guys you know are sort of a bit more used to this way of living and just sitting on gaming all the time um, it's maybe not so easy for people that do have families back at home. And we actually saw this with, this with Joe Marler this week, who is pulled out of um, being part of the England squad, saying that he wants to do right by his family in these crazy times was part of the tweet that he put out. Uh, and there will be quite a few people who feel this, maybe less so at the beginning, but certainly at the end. You know, Wales being a small place, we all live, you know, probably the furthest guy away is about an hour and a half. So... You know, we, we can go out of camp and come back in. But, you know, you're asking your partners, your families to almost isolate for the whole campaign to make sure they're keeping it safe for us as players. So, you know, the the work behind the scenes that, you know, our loved ones do is, is you know, it goes, you know, without thanks probably from an understanding from the outside world, really. Yeah, I, th I think it's a tough part of it, looking at some of the lads. It's grand when you're single. And you have no kind of um, commitments outside of camp. But when you've when you have a family and you have kids and your wife is under pressure and 
know what I mean? It's a lot. Of, it's a lot on the boys, and I do think you know. I'm, I'm, I presume it's going to be very similar in Ireland that they'll, they'll try and get them home as often as they can to to see their their uh, partners and kids and and families. But it, it's it's tough. Like it's tough, and they have to be so careful now as well. Because if you are getting out of camp and going home, you know what I mean. You can't be taking any risks bringing bringing anything back mm. in. No. Etc. But uh, yeah. yeah, I certainly if I had if I had a few kids at home, I would find it tough being away from from for that length of time. And I understand Joe is a very um, you know big family man, and you know he's done he's done stuff like this before as well. So um, he probably sees the bigger picture in it all. You know, Ruby's going to end for him someday, and he's he's not willing to miss I suppose certain um, parts of his kids and and his family life. So it is. Uh, it's a big deal to to leave England off, but it's um it's yeah. something that uh, you know is probably more important to him at the minute. I think your perspective and priorities change as you go through your career. Mm. Well, the four nations um, here have announced their Six Nations squads in the last week. Um, we thought we'd take a quick look at them. Let's start with Ireland. So I suppose Sean, and it's not for the first time. The headline is no John Cooney. Um, instead, Andy Farrell has gone for. Munsters, Craig Casey, but how surprised were you that um, John Cooney had been left out again? I wasn't that surprised, to be honest. And not because John hasn't been going well or anything. It's because his two first-choice scrum halves at the minute are, are Connor and and Jemison. And Craig has really impressed mm-hmm. um, when he's played with Munster. And he's he's a little bit of attitude about him and he's um, he's brought a lot of energy to their side when he's on the field. So I think he's just bringing him in to give him more experience, and um, maybe he might get a run. Um, but I think I think the, the Gemmo and and Connor are obviously first and second choice at the minute. So I think he's more so bringing him in for experience, and he sees him as potentially, um, you know, a big big player in the next World Cup. So I wasn't too um, surprised on on the squad and especially on that on that situation I know everyone's talking about John is playing very well and he's consistent and he's he's a goal kicker too um, you know just maybe maybe he just hasn't pushed hard enough on, on big occasions for for the management um, to to make him select him so it's um, it's tough on him because he's not doing anything wrong um, there's just there's just a few lads there that have mm-hmm. that have done really well and had big moments in in certain games recently. He played against us in months uh, when we played Munster start of the year, and you know he's a real live wire and he's got mm-hmm. a bit of attitude about him, like uh, you know he's pretty punchy. So um, you know I think he's he's done well for Munster when obviously Connor hasn't been playing. He was one of those players that um, we were hearing about when he was coming up to the Irish under twenties. He was actually someone that. Um, I'd say if Munster hadn't given him a contract, I'd say Leinster were going to go after him. Foxy, as you say, he has a good attitude and he has a little bit of bite about him. I really like him um, because he's he's not obviously very big or anything, but yeah. he's strong. He's like a stringer-esque figure, but he's he's just a bit more attitude and bite about him. Um, and he is he is a lively yeah. type of fella. So it's, it's good to see him in there and it's good to see that we're going to breed another few guys maybe during this uh, campaign. The main criticism that seems to have been levelled about this squad is that it's not a squad for the future. It's tried and tested. There isn't a mass- massive amount of player evolution there. Is that the time to do that though now, or do you simply just play what's in front of you? No, it's it's they're in this transition phase. Don't forget, still they've they've only played a few games under under Andy, and I think in order for them to get to the place where they want to get to, they have to stick with. You know the boys he started with. Obviously, there'll be more introductions in the next year or two, hopefully, and more players coming through. But they have to get the plan right first. They have to execute the plan right, and um, you know you need a bit of experience. And while while it's an experienced squad and people are tried and tested, they have to play the game that they want to play, and they haven't done that yet. So when they get when they start to get that ready or right, I should say, they'll start introducing new blood into that system. And um, gradually progressing then, but it's not it's not a click of a, f- a flick of the switch, and you know you're playing this unbelievable new brand of rugby that he's trying to play. It's a different environment, different coaches. Mm. You know they brought Paulie in there now to put Simon to um, defence coach, Paulie forwards coach. So <clears throat> I don't think they've been getting much payout or mall in in recent times. So that's one thing that I'm sure Paulie will will get the grips with pretty quickly, and. Um, 
hopefully you see Ireland attacking attacking again in that area. There's lots of development going on in that setup, and I'm sure you'll see more of that during the Six Nations. It mightn't be perfect, but I presume that's the plan of trying to just develop the game plan that they've been trying to implement in in um, in November. I think what you look at as well is the, you know, the Six Nations is where you want to get results. I think the autumn was an opportunity, like speaking from a Welsh perspective, to give opportunity. And I think what Wayne said and publicly, you know, it's, it's, it's all about results now. And so you, you probably, mm-hmm. you, you can't give opportunity unless you're you know, putting your hand up at, at club level. Yeah, well, let's move on to England because... Um... Eddie Jones is uh, seems to be trying to constantly adjust that age profile of his squad. He's brought in two young, electrifying players, Harry Randall and Paolo Adogwu. Um, they're impressive, Jonathan, aren't they? Yeah, I saw the Wasps-Bath game, which was uh, an unbelievable match on a Friday night, I think it was. And, um, yeah. you know, he did set the game alight. You know, he, he seems to have it all um, extremely quick from first 10, 15 metres and... He's 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 built like a block as well, you know. So um, he he seems that he's he's they're using him well at Wasps, and he's getting the opportunity now with the England squad. So you'd like to think that Eddie's obviously um, looking to blood new players in, um, and they're obviously picking a smaller squad as well. Um, so he's obviously yeah. said that they're going to get opportunity. And um, Harry Randall, um, he mm. was in the academy in Clancy with us, but um, yeah. I think he went to school. Um, in England somewhere and then uh, signed with Bristol so yeah and he's gone well and um, I think he was on the Welsh radar with us but um, you know he's decided to or been picked for England now so um, well yeah. you know, the Welsh not, didn't not pick him did they? God. Oh, I obviously <laughs> didn't pick him exactly so um, you've got Randall going that way and you've got Sheedy going that way so uh, the M4's uh, <laughs> switched sides for some of these guys um, but you made a good point there about um the the smaller squad, Sean. How much of a risk is it to to pick a, a smaller squad, or are you just ensuring that everybody gets a go? Because already before a match has been played, we've got Sam Underhill out, we've got Joe Launchbury out. I think it gives a bit of certainty to the to the whole thing when it's a bit smaller and people can get on with their jobs and know where they're going to fit into into the camp environment or into that actual squad. Um, so I don't I don't see a problem with it. I think it's just going to be very clear of what he wants to get out of his players and. This is your job. Do your job. Execute your job, and um, it, it it'll fill them new guys with a bit of confidence. I think not having a lot of players and not getting enough reps and training, etc. Because when you have thirty five or whatever you have in a squad, a big squad, it's very hard to get time on the on the park and very hard to get uh, reps of whatever it may be mm-hmm. for forward lineouts, um, for backs, you know, strike plays, etc. And um, so you only get a handful of opportunities. So when you have a smaller squad, you get more yeah. of them. And that. In turn, that that should give you more confidence in in knowing your role, in knowing the systems, and in just getting on and playing and fitting into the international setup when you're when you're when you've only come in. So I I see the reasoning behind it, and I think um I think it'll give bring on those guys a lot um you know in their development and and again that confidence thing I think is massive for for boys coming in for the first time into international squads. Let them in, let them train, um let them get a feel for it, and you know. Those weeks, you, you don't really forget those weeks when you're going into an England Wales game or an Ireland Wales game, and there's huge excitement. And um, I know it's a bit different because the fans aren't there now, but still, there'll be excitement in camp, and lads will want to get going and and hit the ground running. So, um, I think it'll it'll only be good for those boys having a smaller squad. England's first match is against Scotland, and Gregor Townsend has opted for a, a youth a mix of youth and experience. Cameron Redpath is probably the biggest headline and, and kind of a relief that he's come back to Scotland and followed his family roots after a few outings for the England uh, under-20s and the underage groups. Um, he is a, he's a real, real coup, isn't he, Jonathan? Yeah, he, we played against us um, in Europe before Christmas and, um, you know, you can tell he's talented. Um, he's timing the ball and he scored a very good individual try, I think, in that Wasps game, you know. So mm-hmm. um, he would have had experience playing with um, in between JJ and Reese Priestland. And, you know, he'll he'll be going into camp, like you said, with confidence and um, hoping to, you know, put his hand up for for selection, you know. So it'll be um, uh, an experience for him. And, you know, he, he's shown... Um, playing for Bath, that he does have um, a great deal of, of talent. 
Scotland have a, a problem at hooker. They've got Fraser Brown out, Stuart McAnally out. But apart from that, um, you know, the fact that Stuart Hogg's there, Finn Russell is going to be part, you know, starting the Six Nations, very much a key part of the team. They've got people like Cameron Redpath. Um, it, it's quite a s- strong squad from a Scottish perspective. Quite an exciting time. Sean. Yeah, I think, yeah, but there's one thing about it. I don't think, I think missing those two boys, as you just mentioned, is going to be a massive part of, of Scotland. Mm-hmm. And I am... Um, I would worry about up front now missing those two boys in particular, especially at scrum time. So you can have Finn Russell and Stuart Hogg and all these boys that are well able to play in the back line, but you have to be able to get them the ball. you got to get the ball. Yeah, and um, that's probably a worry, I'd say, now at the minute um, for Scotland. And I think I'd be worried about up front for them um, at the minute with the few injuries they have because those two boys are a big part of the Scottish mentality and a, and a big part of their pack and, and how to go about yeah. the business. And just in November, I thought they had improved a lot. They improved a lot of areas, scrum-wise and uh, around their set piece. So I think they'll I think they'll have a little dip there just missing those those two cogs that they, they really need. One, like, obviously starting and the other coming off the bench. So um, whoever fills that void will have a big task on their hands. But um, if they do get good, clean, quick ball to those boys that we've talked about, it is, go- it is going to be exciting because Finn will be relishing <laughs> the opportunity to get back in and put his stamp on things. And Hoggy will obviously, um, you know, being a proud Scottish man that he is, and want to set the place alight too. So hopefully they just do it together and not, uh, not go on on their own... Um, you know, uh, rampage themselves. So um, it is. It is exciting if if they get the balance right for Scotland for sure. I definitely think they've improved anyway. Let's move on to Wales, um, Jonathan. No, Rhys Webb was probably the standout in amongst the squad. Was that a surprise? I think if you know, if you look at the scrum off, um, you know, crop we've got um, with Gareth Davis, Thomas Williams coming back from injury, and. Kieran Hardy, who is a youngster who's who's gone re- extremely well for us at the Scarlets, and he has a a great mindset. Um, so yeah, you know, Webb, you'd be bitterly disappointed um, not to be involved, I'm sure. But um, you know, I think um, Wayne's had conversations with him, explained what he needs to do, and I think as long as he has that uh, clarity, you know, Reese can go away and um, work on his game, and you know, I'm sure you know he, he can put his hand up again, you know, and it, it was a shock because he's got a huge amount of experience, but, um, you know, scrum half is something where we have a lot of talent um, in, our, in our squads, you know, so... Um, when I saw he wasn't in the squad, I suppose, with the younger guys that you have there and and the young guy that's in your Scarlet squad, it's... it's he's Wayne is obviously looking towards the next World Cup as well. Like, is he going to be... Is he going to be a part of that, like... Um, so like he's probably thinking maybe maybe or maybe not yeah. like but obviously he scored two good tries at the weekend. Um, he well he did ans- he answered that well didn't he? Um, to be fair to him. Um, yeah, it, it's 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 always nice to do that if you're not selected in something or you get a bit of a kick in the in the backside. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a tough one on him because he is in good form. But I think they're looking to the future as you're saying, uh, Foxy, with those younger guys and. That's the only reason you could leave him over really at the minute, especially with his experience and how dangerous he is. He is a dangerous yeah. player, and um, you know he's always one you you always keep your eye on him when you're playing against him. Yeah. So. And like I said, we've just got a strong crop of scrum halves, and you know it's, it's probably yeah. one of our strongest positions. So um, let's move on to uh, your first caps because we've spoken a little bit about um, people who are getting the opportunity to to join up with their national squad for the first time. They'll be desperately hoping that they can get their first cap. Um, Foxy, we'll start with you. Just uh, tell us about how you heard the emotion of the time that you first told that you'd be going to play for Wales. Well, I think you um, you get a text from uh, Caroline, who's um, team manager's... Well, she does all the work, basically. She looks after, like, 40 boys, and she's amazing, Kaz. And you get a text off her, and you come into camp. And my first campaign was uh, the 2009 Summer Tour, when every other... Uh, Welshman was on the Lions tour. Um, the, the the leftovers went to North America on a tour, so I got capped on that tour. And then my first experience being coached by Gats was um, what you call in the autumn that fall that same year. So um, yeah, you just go in and you don't say anything to anyone unless spoken to. Um, and I remember my first roommate was Nugget Martin Williams, and yeah. 
Um, yeah, it's just surreal. Like you grow up watching these players. Um, uh, it, it was brilliant. And I was named in the team to play uh, New Zealand on the bench and didn't get on. Um, but there was a few senior boys in the squad from the Scarlets, like Dav Jones, uh, Dwayne Peel and all. So after the game, I went back to the hotel and they were like, um, Foxy coming for a beer? And I was like, green as grass. And I was just like, yeah, I'll come for a beer. And then um, next thing I know, it's 3.30 in the morning. And um, Alan Phillips, team manager, is like, ah, calling me over. And he goes, listen, you're a good boy. Uh, you know, I'm worried I am. I said, oh, what's wrong? I haven't drunk that much. He goes, no, I'm not worried about that. The fact that you didn't get on the field and you're still drinking at 3.30, got out me when you're playing and I have to look after you then. Um, <laughs> So no, I think um, you do remember your first, you know, campaigns and everything else so well, and um, they're just fond memories, very fond memories. And now Nugget would be calling the youngsters out in his role now, and he yeah, must have been like the, the the babysitter because I think he he told me once when he was working at BBC with me that he had to sort of room with George North for George's first cap as well. So he was yeah. obviously the responsible adult early on. Now as your team manager. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I think um, at the time, Nugget doesn't live too far from from the Vale. So I went yeah. in and like I gave him the bigger beds, you know, respect your elders. And um, and literally I was in my room and obviously I didn't know Nugget went home. So he was staying at home and I was just like, "Is he must he must not like me. He's gone to sleep somewhere <laughs> else and stuff. Um, but yeah, no, he's he was always the one who would... Um, take on the new boy so it was he's, he's great now in his role as well he's um he knows the crack really well and shawnee what was it like for you how did you find out yeah it was actually my current dor at the minute Declan kidney gave me my first uh first cap but being in camp that week was pretty exciting myself and seven and johnny sexton got capped the same night so we were all all in camp that week and i remember um he ne he never he never spoke to me before he announced the squad, and just the sheer excitement of uh, being on the bench uh, was incredible. And I kind of I'd spoke to him a few times pre in the previous few weeks about like what do I have to do to get into the squad, blah blah blah. And I was kind of itching to get going. So, and then after about twenty minutes, Dennis Leamy went, or yeah, was it Dennis Leamy? Dennis Leamy got injured in that Fijian game. Um, and he, he kind of, he was hobbling away till about half time, I think. And then, uh, he, he told me at half time, right, you're going on. And then you just, uh, you just get out there and play. But I was certainly a bit nervous beforehand. And, you know, you talk about afterwards, the, the, the first cap protocols of, um, every, every lad in the squad having to buy you a drink. So, um, yeah, I remember dancing. I remember dancing on the middle of a table, um, in the hotel afterwards. <laughs> I don't even know what kind of dancing I was doing. It could have been Irish dancing or something, but I was soon pulled down off the table anyway and sent on my way to bed. Um, but we we had a great night because we all got capped that night, a few of us. And um, yeah, it's it's those those nights are the ones that kind of stay with you uh, for for a long long time. And um, uh, the senior boys definitely don't really mind you either. They kind of they want you to to get as loose as a goose and um let loose yeah, yeah. They don't, they're, they're definitely not putting their arm around just saying here take it easy now tonight i think it's just your first one is always the the one that they they want to um get you get you messed up but um yeah no great 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 memories of that and um decky's decky's still the same man to this day <laughs> which is quite funny too it must always be quite strange though because an opportunity for somebody also means that someone through whatever reason has uh, lost their place in a side and that must be slightly awkward and Foxy I just want you to to tell us the story about the third lion's test if you sort of recall back to that one I know it's not the same as you know taking somebody's place for Wales but you took Brian O'Driscoll's place for that third lines test, you know that must have been, that must have been a, a, an awkward one as well, especially when you're all away on a tour and you're still. I remember that actually, Lee. Before yeah. Foxy talks here, I remember that Foxy was going around camp, cock of the hoop after he got named in the team that day. He didn't mind about he didn't mind <laughs> O'Driscoll being dropped at all. While the rest of us were were, were nearly in tears, like. But <laughs> we had a, you had a good man to fill his boots anyway. It was. A weird one. It was an eventful week, to say the least. And I think um, the morning the team was being announced, um, Gats and Rob Howley called me in. 
to the office and I was playing 12 in the first two tests and they said, you need to learn the role for this move for the 13 jersey. And I was like, okay. And I start smiling and they're like, oh, you're right. So yeah, I was just, I just said like, oh, it's, it's all going to kick off soon. Um, and I think um, the, the team was announced and we get on the bus to go to training and obviously being a younger member of the squad, I was down the front and, you know, I didn't haven't had earned my stripes to be at the back at that point. And, um, you know, fair play to Dricko. He walks past, shakes my hand, congratulates me. And yeah, it was, um, you know, there was a responsibility then to make sure um, we went out and won the third test. And thankfully we did in, in fine fashion. And yeah, I just remember doing press one night um, before the third test. And they were like, oh, we're going live on Sky Sports now. And I was like, right, head on now, John. Uh, get your best foot defense front foot defensive out and first question live on sky was oh jonathan davis you picked ahead of brian o'driscoll that must mean you're a better player than him and i was like oh my god <laughs> good no and um you know it was obviously it was a talking point but um you know there was 45 people out there trying to win a test series and yeah. there would have been 20 odd disappointed blokes as well and you know thankfully we went out there and did a job and we all had beers together afterwards and you know that, that those couple of days afterwards are some of the best memories i've had in rugby you know i can't remember uh, so I, I i i can't remember much of it but like honestly it was just you know it's 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 some of the you know the best times you have as a rugby player and and you know that's the thing you feel at the moment with obviously no crowds and not being able to do um the social things is it's just the younger generation of boys are experiencing for the first time and not getting a taste of that because I think it's what's special about our game. And, um, you know, hopefully sooner rather than later that can come back and, you know, boys can, you know, get a feel for, um, I was thinking earlier about one of the, you know, one of the best things about your first cap or first test in Cardiff is the bus journey into Cardiff. You know, you see mm -hmm. the fans lining the, the streets and everyone applauding you and, probably chucking pints at uh, Shawnee's bus and stuff like that. Uh, I, the, my very first experience at Cardiff, I don't know if I told you this before, was um, obviously it's the place is going mental. Um, the atmosphere is electric. You just can't wait to actually, like you swear you're at a home game going down to Cardiff. You have know, Irish lining the streets, you have the, the Welsh that love the Irish and everyone's just having a big party. But my very first time, going down that way we were there was these three girls and they were to the left hand side and you could see them so clearly because all had like white tops and these little short skirts on them <laughs> you couldn't miss them and like. cowboy hats and cowboy hats that's a trend in Cardiff <laughs> and cow yeah that that actually I think they did actually have cowboy hats but as we were driving the bus was driving past I was like this must be an absolute wind up they're trying to distract us here obviously <laughs> up with the up with the skirts and they all mooned us so they did <laughs> The Irish bus. I was like, whatever age. I think I was twenty one or two at the time. Kind of completely wet behind behind the ears. I was like, what <laughs> is going on here? And what time yeah, are we yeah, heading yeah, out yeah. later? At? Everyone loves playing the Cardiff. So, well, everyone um, loves playing the Cardiff. Ah, uh, it was great crack afterwards. But um, yeah, that was that was my first experience of actually going down yeah. uh, the the bus route to the to the stadium and the horses in front of you. It was yeah. class. Now to it's be something fair. special, I have to say. <laughs> Well, last week we had Luke Menzies on who made the switch from Rugby League to WWE Wrestling. And I'm delighted to say that this week we've got Nick Campbell, who was a rugby union player in Glasgow for Scotland Underage Group and then went over to Jersey and is now following his dream to become a professional boxer. Nick, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell us about your story. First of all, tell us a, a bit more about your rugby. Yeah, well, I obviously started up through the age group system in Glasgow and um, moved on through the district levels and stuff like that. Represented Scotland at uh, under 20 and under 18. Uh, off the back of that, got my first contract with Glasgow Warriors in 2009 as part of their academy. Uh, progressed on from that and got a full professional contract with them. Uh, played two years full professional. Then left in 2013 to go and play for Jersey Reds in the English Championship to get more regular game time. Uh, nearly played 100 games for Jersey. Uh, had some, you know, great experiences and stuff like that, and made some friends for life and that on the island. And then 2017, 
27 decided that I was going to chuck it because I felt like I'd kind of, you know, I'd fell, fallen out of love with the sport a bit. I, w- I wanted to try and kick on back up to the higher level again and it wasn't quite working out for me. And then I felt like if I was going to have a go at boxing, then it was the, the time to really have a crack at it before I got too old. So, yeah, that's that's where I'm now. And why boxing? Is that as always? That's always been a love in the background for you. Yeah, my, my grandfather was a professional boxer, um, and my dad boxed as well. He wasn't a professional then, but he boxed as well. So, I've always had an interest in the sport. Um, it's always been something quite close to my heart. I remember growing up. I'm sure the other lads watched boxing as well. Growing up, it's it's quite a popular sport. So. I was always interested, I was always keen, I was always, you know, wanting to find out a wee bit of training and stuff around my rugby, so it's always just something I've been passionate about. Who was your favourite boxer when you were uh, growing up? Joe Kozaghi was one of my favourites, I actually yeah. went and watched him at the Millennium Stadium, so uh, yeah. Joe, Joe's probably one of my, my favourite Brit- British fighters of all time, Lennox Lewis, I uh, used to love watching Ricky Hatton, I actually went down and watched Ricky Hatton in Manchester as well when I was young, so... The they were probably my three, the hitman, aye, the hitman, some character as well. So he had a massive following, yeah. eh? right up until he fought Mayweather. Did you, bu- button, do so. you balloon in between fights like he did? No, nah, I try not to, mate. So I'm not big enough <laughs> as it is. I don't need to get any bigger. <laughs> say he doesn't. I say he doesn't drink for a week or two solid. I'd say. Um, <laughs> how do you find the training, Nick? Now that it's individual for you, let's say. I know you've obviously teammates in in your boxing gym but how do you find it now compared to like the team environment and having like 14 other lads with you on the field um you know when you're going into battle now you've only you out there Uh, aye it's it's different i mean you know you know yourself you might not be having the best game and somebody can pick you up and drag you with them uh you you know you've got 14 other guys to lean on you don't you don't really have anybody to lean on when you're in the ring do you know what i mean it's so it's that aspect's different but there's a lot of stuff that transfers over you know uh, the discipline and getting up and early in the morning, make sure you're eating the right stuff. Uh, trying, you know, trying to just love a disciplined life. It, a lot of the different elements transfer over, but you do definitely miss the the yeah. team aspect. I think sometimes, you know, there's a lot of camaraderie between the lads and everything, the banter, the joking, and all that. So I I do, I do miss that aspect of my rugby. So you've been you were amateur for four years. So why is the decision? now COVID allowing that for you to to go pro and hopefully you'll have your um your sort of your first fight soon yeah just the COVID situation was the main thing really to be honest with you it was amateur boxing I was in part of the Scottish elite boxing group so I was on route to go to the Commonwealth Games but who knows if that's even going to happen now and um obviously the elite sport banner everything can operate under so I, I felt like, you know, go, having a go at professional boxing, it was something that I'd always, you know, as, aspired to try and achieve. I had an opportunity to do that. What what about funding, Nick? How, like, I suppose, like, when you're on a full-time professional rugby contract, you're obviously getting paid. Yeah. Um. So, like, what way does it work now with with, with boxing in terms of financially for you, as <coughs> well, well you security-wise? You get paid when you fight, so uh, yeah. I mean, it, there's a lot less security than there is in professional rugby, to be honest with you. But um, mm. I'm lucky to have some some really good sponsors and stuff like that on board as well, who contribute toward living costs, training costs, and I actually work. I'm actually a personal trainer. Um, I work, I'm still oh, living in Jersey. I work over in Jersey as a personal trainer, but it fits in quite well around all my training. I'm in a gym, so when I need to need to do a bit of training if I need time off people understand I always you know kind of prepare them for the fact that I'm going to be away for lengths of time in my my boxing and stuff like that so it's a tough one until you kind of make it at top, if you ever do make it at the top level a lot of these guys mm. have got amazing sponsorship and everything's paid for and the fight money is probably enough to live off for the year anyway but I mean yeah. that's the goal that maybe we can get to that level one day but who knows I used to go to Jersey every summer um, obviously my my brother lives there, but um, it was I found it a class place in the summer. I know it's only oh, I know it's a- only small and it's it's ten miles in circumference or whatever it is, but it's yeah, uh, yeah. placed as we hopping. Oh, it's amazing. Do you know what? Like a lot of people, when you tell them about Jersey, they kind of go ten, like nine by five mile. That sounds you know terrible, mm-hmm. but honestly, it's a, an amazing place to be. Plus the the nightclub I used to go to was Splash Mimosa. 
splash oh, out there. Yeah, right out in the wilderness. Aye. Right out in the wilderness. <laughs> it's a rough, rough hard. enough all joint to be fair. That's your comfort zone, that isn't that's it? That's Stevie's <laughs> kind of place to be fair. I've often thought about actually after after finishing playing rugby, I've genuinely thought about because it's such a disciplined sport. I'd love to do it. But I'd love to do it not in obviously that serious I don't way. Get I wouldn't mind a, yeah, oh, I, I wouldn't, mind, I wouldn't mind a few white collar white collar events or something like that. Sean, we're always looking for sparring partners, so you never know, mate. We could get you drafted oh, yeah. if you fancy. I'm gonna jump at that like go in and get the head cut off like, for, for a couple of rounds of G boys. <laughs> um uh, Nick, before you head off, will you have time to watch the Six Nations? Of course I'll be supporting Scotland. Um no, no point I, I, don't know. I don't like to say too much because we always end up falling short but I, I, I hope the boys can do something so nah yeah. but good luck to the lads as well. good luck to Jonathan and the Six Nations appreciate I'm that sure good, luck, good, good luck to you mate hopefully you get that fight soon enough I appreciate that mate thank you yeah but Nick, thanks so much for your time luck, it's been great to, um, best, to have mate. you on the programme really appreciate it no thanks for having me yeah great to hear from Nick and uh, wishing him all the best for when COVID allowing his uh, debut fight happens. Let's now, though, find oh, out Lee, what's Lee, happening Lee, sorry. in the world. I, of- Lee, I got to shoot. I've got a team <laughs> meeting. I've got to go. Um, otherwise, I'm going to find myself. So sorry, guys. Oh. I'm going to have to shoot. Hasta la vista, Foxy. Don't find yourself, fine master. Ciao for Speak now. Soon. Thank you. Ta-da. Yeah, great to hear from Nick and uh, wishing him all the best for when COVID allowing his uh, debut fight happens. Let's now, though, find oh, out Lee, what's Lee, happening Lee, sorry. in the world of... Lee, i got to shoot. I've got a team <laughs> meeting. I've got to go. Um, otherwise, I'm going to find myself. So, sorry, guys. Oh. I'm going to have to shoot. Hasta la vista, Foxy. Don't find yourself, fine master. Ciao for Speak now. Speak soon. Thank you. Well, I didn't like to tell him we have another Welsh player anyway, so that's absolutely fine. <laughs> Adam Jones joins us. Uh, Adam, good to have you along, but I'm sorry about the topic I'm going to have to ask you about because it's been a bit of a, a tough week in the world of Harlequins, hasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it's been interesting, um, <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, it's been, well, I think last time I spoke to you guys, I didn't see it come in, so um, it says it a lot, really. Mm. So just to clarify, uh, Paul Gustard has left Harlequins. It was announced today that he'll be heading to Treviso. Um, but I think that actually did happen um, like the day after we recorded our programme. So it mm. it was a bolt out of the blue then, Adam. Yeah, it was, um, yeah, it was, as you said, it, was, it all came a bit of a shock and it all happened pretty quickly. Um, we had the, the dreaded phone call, can you come and meet the um, uh, lorry, the uh, CEO, and it was... Yeah, it was, you kind of knew what was going on the cards. We, we sort of spoke to Gazi, to be fair. He, um, on the Monday, he kind of, and we, he called us in. We had a chat about certain bit, bits and bobs. But, um, yeah, we didn't we probably didn't see it uh, coming quite as quick as it happened. So, no, it was, you know, the club have got to do what they got to do. And, um, you know, they're the ones who, you know, at the end of the day, there's, was it, 150 odd years of the Quins. And um, certainly we're just trying to um, get in a better place. And But, yeah, you know, all I can say is we've, it came a bit quick and it was a bit of a shock, really. And what's the atmosphere like within a team, within a squad, when something like that happens? Um, it's, it's weird. It's, um, it's, well, it's not the first time it's happened when I've been involved. I've been involved, um, it happened with the Ospreys and I was involved, well, I was in the squad when Mike Ruddock uh, you know, left during the 2006 Six Nations. And uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a weird feeling, it's strange. It's... Um, you know, we, uh, well, certainly I spent a lot of time with Paul and, um, you know, I don't mind calling him Paul. I've never called him Paul once. So I know I spent a lot of time with Gezi, um, <laughs> over the last, uh, two and a half years and, uh, you know, got to know him well, you know, good mate now. And yes, yeah, so it's, it's sad to see you go and it's sort of sad to see him go. And I knew, oh, look, I knew he was going to, you kind of know he's going to have something straight away, <laughs> fortunately, because he's, uh, you know, he's such a good coach and he's got that, um, reputation. So no, I think, uh, look, I, you know, Wish him well, and you know I miss him, and he's you know I've learned a lot from him, and um, you know he's come from some you know big environments and uh, played and you know coached some uh, you know brilliant teams in the, the English game, and uh, you know Saracens obviously in the England team. So it's been yeah, he was yeah he'll be uh, he'll be missed. He seems he seems to be a really um, nice man, like and a well liked man. Yeah, but he's, it's like, yeah, yeah. Go on, it, go on. It, it's a it's a. I think I think like it's a gentle reminder as well to to us all like that how how fickle I suppose you know rugby as as a profession is and coaching obviously in your in your job but like 
I suppose from what we've heard, like in terms of um, the outside world, is that like they didn't they didn't want to renew his contract. Um, and for him, I suppose then he has to look after his family and, um, you know, look at his look at his career and long, the longevity of it. So it's quite a tough position to be in, I think. And and fair play to him as well for making the the hard decision to actually you know not see it out and, and get something straight away. And I know about him, you're you're friends with him, obviously. So I I don't know like the mindset of all other coaches, but it is it is a it's a tough job coaching. Yeah, it's, um, oh, I agree. Yeah, it's it's a lot harder than you expect, and you kind of all. I guess you always look. You always the you're the first one out. You know, uh, obviously because mm-hmm. he's because uh, he's taking the fall for the, uh, you know, um, how we haven't uh, coached well enough, and um, as a, as a group of uh, as a group of coaches, so you know, and he's taking the fall for it. So, but like he's a, you know he's a great he's a great coach. He's defensively he's excellent. His actual rugby knowledge is is unbelievable, and it's, um. And the big thing I guess I learned from him um, is you know presenting to players and how he, like speaking in front of a group you know he's like he's got he's got mad ideas and he's always had like yeah I know he brought wolves in when he was in Saracens and you know he so first he did it with us get this big giant bear involved and you know like he he's, he thinks mm. you know so far outside the box around how to deliver stuff and how to get the message across and he is constantly. What I will say, he works. I've never seen and like work ethic is unbelievable, mm-hmm. and he works so hard. And he works, um, yeah. You know, we sort of we're all in at six. You know, we a lot of the time we don't leave till six, half past six. So you know, it's it's something that as a player I probably didn't realize the sort of days coaches go through. You know, but it's uh, yeah, it is it is a tough gig because I guess you know being a player and I'm involved, you know, kind of it's, you kind of it's sort of um, I don't know what the word is, but when I was involved as a player, it's kind of, it kind of just go, goes over your head because you're so focused on the rugby and, you know, and it's not, you don't have really too many outside, um, you know, issues and problems. But yeah, this week's it's been a bit, it's like the good old days. Well, it's when we had the, it happened to the Ospreys with us and, well, we went on to win the league that year. So it was, um, I think we beat Leinster in the final, actually, um, if I remember correctly. You did? And uh, yeah. You Were did? you playing? Uh, no, I didn't play, actually. I played the Rest, week rested. before in the European rested. final. <laughs> oh well done, Sean. Good answer. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose you know we maybe have rose tinted glasses on when we are in rugby. We look at a sport like football, and you kind of expect it. And there's been this outcry about Frank Lampard this week losing his job, and you know that wouldn't happen in rugby because you know everyone is a much nicer feel to it. And then you actually hear, I think Alex Good talked about it on this pod the other day. Um, you know, players are commodities and maybe coaches are commodities and this is a business and this will happen. And the bigger that the sport gets, Adam, the more likely it is that it not goes the way of football, but people have to be much more accountable. Yeah, oh, 100%. I think, you know, it's a results-based and and at the end of the day, if the coaches aren't, if we're not getting a message across or to the players and we're not doing a good enough job and then the results aren't coming, then you're, you're the first to go and it's... um. And the club, the, you know, the club have got to look after themselves, and what they've got to do what sees what they see fit. And you know, as a, a group of coaches, you know, you appreciate that. And you know, it's as I said, it's a massive club. Uh, it's hundred and fifty years old. It's you know, an incredibly famous club around the world. And you know, when we're not to the level the club want, then you know, these type of things happen. And and yeah, it's not quite. I don't think it's quite to the football level yet, but certainly. No. Certainly, um, yeah, every now and again you get these kind of, um, well, certainly this year with Steve Diamond and Guzzi and this type of thing. It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's slowly teetering into that way. Yeah, it's a tough, I, I think it's a tough one because in, in certain clubs, I think are they in like, are they in a, a phase or are they in, do they have a strong enough squad to do what the actual club wants to do straight away? And that's very tough on coaches then because at the end of the day, mm-hmm. as Bomb just said, they're judged on performance and wins or losses, etc. So it's it's about um, the the hierarchy knowing what type of squad they have too, and where they want to go and how long it's going to take to get there, and um, that's that's tough as well, obviously, because they want results. But it takes time to to get something very right, and um, yeah, of course, yeah. you know, in every club, um, so yeah, it's it's about having a bit of patience too. I think. Um, for the for the hierarchy, or the lads in the suits, as I always call them, but it's uh, it's definitely um, it's definitely results uh, driven, and um, you know owners want owner owners want wins, um, and they want 
the club to be doing as well as possible and it'd be no different in our own club if, if things weren't going well or the right direction. No, yeah. But also, yeah, no, you are. also players and coaches need to look after themselves. You know, that the, the hierarchy in the business can look after itself, but coaches and players also need to look after themselves. And you could say that we've seen that this week again, um, Adam, with Chris Ashton choosing to leave Quinns. Yeah, no, that, oh, look, it's... Um... I know Gezi knew him from um, you know the Saracens days, and uh, I mean, well, first first thing with he's you know he's a obviously an unbelievable player. He has he's had a, you know, a lot a lot of niggles with us, you know, and a few um, issues around uh, not not big in, injuries, but you know, but when he came, you know, he's Chris was this he's he's what we needed, you know, he spoke his mind and um, you know, he, but he wasn't he wasn't playing, and we went um, yeah. with different uh, different players. Um, Obviously, um, wing wing play isn't uh, wouldn't be my uh, you know strength, and they wouldn't uh, understand a great deal of it. You know, they you know, ch- they get the ball, they score tries, they chase a few kicks, and that seems about it to me. But we're um yeah he he had a few niggles. He you know when he started he um you know he wanted to see the Chris Ashton of old. We saw glimpses of it, and and he's decided to go on, and uh, you know he'll. I think he, he obviously he thinks he's still got a fair bit left in the tank, and you know with the way you know he looks after himself, he's very professional. You know he's obviously been I think a pro for the, like God knows how long, probably you know cl- close enough twenty years. So he still looks after himself really well, and you know I'm sure he'll do a great job down in Worcester. You know um, I got a, yeah. a good mate who's their head coach now, and uh, you know I'm sure they'll, they'll um, do well together. Don't they? Yeah, it's a uh, he's I think that'll be his fifth. Premiership club. He's a great guy, Chris. He's like he's got the Panini sticker album. Remember when you used to collect stickers in a Panini sticker album? He's he's collecting uh, Prem shirts. I think <laughs> he's just got a much bigger sticker album. He's just sticking a shirt in every time. Yes, yeah. uh, but yeah, it's it's great for Worcester to get their hands on somebody like Chris. Um, what does the the week look like for you guys? Because you will have a, a game at the end of this one, which is, seems quite unusual in the last couple of weeks that we've yeah, had. Yeah, we look well, looking forward to it. Um, obviously, we had the kind of with two days at the back of the week last week where we at the you know where you get that you get the old awkward looks and is you know it's like the, the elephant in the room. But we said you know that's just got to pass now. We can't you know this, mm-hmm. what's in the past is past. Just got to crack on. We got wasps. We, we're doing incredibly well, and they um we just know what a sort of challenge they're going to bring. And yeah, there's a group of four coaches with um you know with Billy Millard, who was who was the general manager, who's now coming in to sort of help us out a bit. You know, played uh, played the uh, coach, his coach of eighteen years top flight himself, so he's coming in to help us out a bit. And um yeah, we've uh, put plans together, and you know the boys are just want to eager eager to uh, rip into it now. I think as a player, you just you know we. You get all the weirdness and you crack on, and then as soon as the working week or the week of the game comes, you just have to just forget all about what's happened in the past and just uh, put your front uh, best foot forward and just get on with it. It's uh, rock on into it. There's it. nothing else you can do. And, and you know the boys and the boys, you know the boys are good. You know the captain spoke is uh, has kind of galvanised the, the the club. You know um, Marlers uh, and DCs, these type of guys are sort of you know dragging everyone with them now, and it's uh, no, it's it's good. It's uh, they're in a good place and they just. You know the challenge of wasps, and uh, just sort of gone on with it. Well, that's good to hear. And um, before we go, it would be remiss of me uh, not to ask you about your thoughts on the Wales squad. Any standouts there? Um, yeah, obviously uh, seeing uh, Dan Lydia back in is, uh, you know, he's done incredibly well. No lids very well. Um, fellow Powys boy, like myself, from back in Wales, and he's you know very very similar to the fella online with us now at the moment. Just a, he's a, he's. I tell you, he's apart from a, the fact that he's, he's got a, a black tractor and Sean's only got a red tractor, that's what we oh, learned right, earlier okay. on. Yeah. Sad times. But no, no, yeah. he's um, he's still, he's still playing international rugby. That's the difference. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad he's back in. I look at uh, Navidi. He's back in. It'll be big for Wales, I think. You know, I don't know. Mm. I don't know what he's going to go. Prevac's going to go with, but you know, you know. I think I'm imagining they go. Daniel will play ten. But, you know, we see someone like Jared Evans and Thomas Williams, for me, is going to be a superstar as well. So if he gets a chance, I think uh, hopefully we can, you know, shock a few people. Because I guess after the last year's gone, they're not going to, um, you know, I guess not, not expect too much. But, you know, there's there'll be question marks around uh, the setup. But there's a lot of quality in there. And I'm, uh, yeah, I'm surprised the, the old fella who um, has just gone offline is uh, still, still making an appearance in the squad because... He hasn't been going too well since I've seen him play this season. (laughs) 
it definitely gets. <laughs> thank God he's offline. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, on that note, gents, thank you very much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much to you all for watching and listening to House of Rugby. We will be back again next week. Bye-bye. You've been watching the House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.